Well, hello friends. Hello again. And this is Lynette coming to you from Christian Roots Canada. Today, I want to share with you a little bit of information that I discovered that will add to your understanding of module four, where Henry II came to the throne. Now, last week, I mentioned that I was reading a book. And this is the book, History of the Huguenots. Uh, History of the Rise of the Huguenots, and this book is very, very fascinating because um, it's bringing more insights to me, which I didn't understand, and I want to share some of that with you because I think it is very, very interesting how some of the history in, well, a lot of the history I am intending to show God's hand in the the settling of canada and uh the oh i want to just put my my computer uh lid down yeah let me just bring this closer yeah so i'm trying to show the um history of france the kings in france and how that led to the settling of Canada. That's the whole premise of the course. Now, also, in all of that, I want to show God's hand and the miraculous things that he has done. And um, in showing God's hand in in leading from one uh, event to the other, which eventually ended up with settling Canada, we can see many parallels in scripture. And that's what I want to bring to you, that a lot of the things that happened in France, when I'm reading the scriptures, I see so many parallels that I feel excited about it because my the, the one of the other premises I have that I tell people all the time is that for us to trace God's hand in history, we have to understand that God uses people. People perform actions. Actions are recorded for us to see them and read about them as events in history. And those events is what, what we would look at as as history. We think that the event is history, but we do not see how God used the people and the people, the actions that the people perform. And you can only really hear that in stories. So my premise is that I I, I hope you would look at these things, and if there is anything that you you question, then. I also encourage you to be like a Berean, so go and do your own research. But I hope that I can just give you a spark and, and make you um, or encourage you to be inspired so that you can go and do some research and, and read up some of the history texts and, and come or, you know, either validate what's being said or dismiss it or you know, uh, uh, actually, you can uh, come to me and or, or send me a text or, or an email and, and, you know, refute it. Um, but anyways, this is what I found and this is what I'm presenting to you. So I want to lead up to the day that Henry IV died. That's the important thing, the day that Henry IV died. Now, before that... Henry had appointed uh, a set of judges to judge the heretics, the people who um, had started reading the scriptures for themselves and wanting to understand scripture. They didn't want to um, turn away from the Catholic faith. They just wanted to um, go back to the roots of, of what the beliefs of the church stemmed from. So, with the persecution of the, the Huguenots, the, the Protestants, the early Protestants, Henry had, through one of his edicts, he had set up 
a special court of judges, the best in the land, the most um, academically acclaimed uh, judges in the land, and he had set them up to judge the heretics. They were noblemen, of course, because they sat in the parliament of, of, the, of France. Since 1556, 1556, the Sorbonne had denounced the Parliament of, of France as uh, uh, being heretical because they suspected some of the noblemen uh, of reading the scriptures and leaning towards Lutheranism. Now, it's interesting that in, in this book, The uh, Rise of the uh, Huguenots, History of the Rise of the Huguenots, uh, it, re it, re uh, it reports that the kings referred to these Protestants at that time as Lutherans because they were, um, because we know that Martin Luther had just, uh, just uh, maybe 30 years before had nailed his theses on the door and he had brought the scriptures to light and it was growing in, in Germany. So this is France and the influence was coming into France from Germany because Germany and France shared this, uh, the same border, just like Canada and the US share the same border. So they were called, in some cases, they were called Lutherans, at least during the time that Henry II was on the throne. Now, Henry II came to the throne when his dad, Francis, died in 1549, I think 1548 or 49. So here is 1556, and the Sorbonne, which is mostly the, the, uh, the, the university that would train uh, priests, and it was you know, one of the best universities in Europe at the time, Sorbonne, and, and many of the members of the Sorbonne sat in the Parliament of France. So the Sorbonne now, it's in 1556, they um, had accused the Parliament of becoming heretical. Henry heard that, and they continued to make that claim, and Henry in 1558, um, being suspicious of these judges um, and you know accusing them of heresy, uh, he decided that he would like to sit in on one of their meetings, which of course he's the king; he can do that. But it was orchestrated by the Catholic nobility and by the leaders of the Sorbonne and the Catholic Church. So uh, two of the main players were Francis Duke of Guise and his brother. Francis Duke of Guise was a very highly decorated military officer who served Francis first and now he's also serving Henry the second, Francis the first son. So Henry of Guise and his brother, Cardinal, um, his brother was uh, Charles, uh, the, he was the Cardinal of Lorraine. They both were very, very close advisors to Henry. And they were totally against the Protestants. And this is important for you to understand when you see what happens with the initiation of the French wars of religion. So uh, the uh, Cardinal of Lorraine, who was Charles, the brother of, of Francis of Guise, Charles of Guise and Francis of Guise, they uh, encouraged Henry to go and sit in on this meeting of the special court of judges who judge the Protestants. The court was called Le Tournay, T-O-U-R-N-E-L-L-E, the Tournay. So uh, 
the accusation was that um, the the those who were charged with Lutheran, Lutheranism were sent into exile, or they were allowed to get off quick, um, uh, uh, easily, and sent to maybe their bishop to to adjudicate the case in their own village, their own town. And because they were dealing with the Protestants um, uh, uh, not as sternly as the guises and the Catholic clergy wanted to, then they themselves, these judges, were considered to be heretics or leaning towards heresy. Now, Diane de Portiers, remember I, I introduced her earlier along because she was one of the ladies that grew up in the court of, uh, in, the, in module one when we de dealt with Hen Francis I and the influences he had around him and the influence of his mother and his sister and the education and that kind of stuff. You heard that uh, uh, Diane de Poitiers was raised in the in the um, courts of of uh, Anne, who was the regent at the time for Charles. So go back and look at module one again. Well, Diane de Poitiers is now she was appointed as um, lady in waiting for for Catherine um, for uh, for Charles for Claude Claude who married Francis the first. For Queen Claude, she was lady in waiting also for Louise of Savoy. So she was in the court when um, Henry was born because she was Henry's mother's lady in waiting. And she developed this relationship with, uh, with Henry when, from the time he came back from, um, from the imprisonment that he had when he was part of the the king's ransom so anyways go back to module one and see that connection between diane de poitiers and henry and what happened with the king's ransom so anyways diane de poitiers uh became really close to henry the second and she was one of his chief advisors so both diane de poitiers and the guises, Francis of Guise and Charles of Guise, Charles was the cardinal, they urged Henry to get involved with the accusations made against his judges who were supposed to be judging the heretics and punishing them because they were punishing them too lightly and they were those judges were accused of heresy also so here is henry he attends the meeting of the tornel uh, tornay and he asked them what they think about the Calvin, the 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 Calvinists, the the heretics, the Lutherans. Well, people who were pro-Calvinist, they called for an ecumenical council where the whole issue could be discussed with respect to what changes needed to make, be made in the church. Um, and in calling for that ecumenical council, it was mentioned that there had been flagrant abuses of the church. Just the kind of language that Henry and the Geysers wanted to hear. There was a, a, one of the judges, Andrew Borg. He addressed the tournée and he said that the cause of Christ should be upheld even by kings. He called for the suspension 
of the persecution of the heretics. And he also suggested that they should have six months to recant. And if they didn't recant in six months, they should be banished. Well, of course, they came across as supporters of the movement. Anti-Calvinists, the people who wanted to persecute the, the Huguenots, the Protestants, uh, reminded Henry that he should be doing like Philip Augustus, who burned 600 heretics at the stake. And he reminded him how Francis, his dad, had suffocated the Waldenses by burning their houses and burning them out where, smoking them out where they were um, hidden in caves. So here you had those two different um, proposals for Henry, be lenient or be more um, stringent. Well, Henry was mad as a hatter. He just was not happy to see that these judges were allowing the people that he wanted executed, he saw that these judges were going lightly on them. So he declared right there and then that Andrew Borg and uh, a guy by the name of Louis Dufour, who had also um, spoken about uh, being lenient with the, with the Protestants, and he, uh, at least Dufour also wanted to call that ecumenical council. So Henry did not like that at all. So he commanded that these two people should be thrown in jail in the Bastille. The Bastille, well, we say Bastille, but they would pronounce it Bastille. It was, you know, that was a fortified dungeon in, in Paris. So these, these two, Anne Borg and Louis de Far, and the three other people, three other judges, noblemen, were thrown into the Bastille. But Anne de Borg particularly was sentenced to burning at the stake. Now, it's interesting how the Lord moved during that time because right during that same time, the, the synod of, of the French Protestants were being birthed, birthed in silently in very, under very secretive conditions in Paris, right not too far from where Henry had put Andubourg in the Bastille for, for execution. Henry planned to watch Andubourg burn. But during that time, it was just before he was uh, preparing for celebration of marrying his daughter off to Philip II of Spain, who was the Holy Roman Emperor at that time. And he just made a treaty with Philip of Spain, which uh, he was celebrating by having his sister marry the Holy Roman Emperor and having his, uh, having his daughter marry the Holy Roman Emperor, not his sister, but his sister was uh, getting married to another very strong uh, Catholic uh, regent, the Duke of Savoy. So he's busy preparing for this great marriage celebration and he set up all the halls were brightly lit with all kinds of torches and they had tournaments, jousting tournaments that were happening to celebrate this big event. Well, the marriage hadn't happened yet. All of these were festivities leading up to the marriage. Uh, he commanded his henchman that immediately after the tournament, he wanted him to destroy all those of Lutheran heresy. And he said, he said you should destroy those of Lutheran heresy with the sword, and you should 
gouge out the eyes of those that are suspected of Lutheran heresy, and you should torture and burn those who are guilty. On the last day of the tournament, Henry rode again in honor of Diane de Poitiers, his concubine, and he was, before he went, Catherine, his wife, was terrified with dreams. And she warned him, she begged him not to go out riding. She told him how, the, how she had dreamt these terrible dreams about him dying. And he dismissed her concerns. Well, he went out there and the lance of his opponent struck him right through the eyeball into his brain. And he was taken right away and, and laid in one of the big halls, the great halls where it was highly decorated for the wedding ceremonies. Interestingly, and this is very interesting, on the big, on the wall, on one of the walls, there was a beautiful woven tapestry with the uh, a picture of St. Paul on the road to Damascus with the words, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now that was an amazing thing for me to read yesterday. Right there, he is laid dying in the hall where there is that huge tapestry hanging on the wall saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And when it was realized what was on the tapestry, it was quickly moved away. Now, shortly after he was taken away from that first location and into his bedchamber where he died just 10 days later. I want you to see the way God in his sovereignty set that whole thing up. Here is Henry planning to march onto the cities where he called, he thought there was a Lutheran hotbed of activity. And he says, after I'm finished with my jousting, I want you to, I will march with you on these people. And I would, we would kill them with the sword, those who are guilty and those who are leading the, the church. And if we suspect them, we will poke their eyes out. And, and those who are guilty, we will burn them at the stakes. And he was planning to do that the next day. And what happened in God's providence, that was Henry's action, look at God's action. God in his providence had Henry injured badly, so much so he was laid just under the tapestry saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Henry was taken out of commission by God in 10 days. I wanted to point that out to you. The scriptural uh, references that you can find easily in the Bible and the fact that Catherine de Medici, what happened to her happened to Pilate's wife, Matthew 27, 19. So I'll encourage you to go read that and listen to this again and hear how the Lord used dreams, tapestries, a broken lance to get the enemies of the gospel out of the way. And we will hear more about that in the next Facebook Live next week Friday. So I will look forward to talking to you. Come on. Listen, leave a comment, 
And let me know what you think of all of this. Remember, God uses people. People perform actions. Actions are, are recorded as events, and the event was a celebration of marriage. And those events go down as the big events of history. So we will talk to you later, and I will see you here again next Friday. Bye for now. To learn more about the Christian roots of Canada's history, visit our website at christianrootscanada.org.